Hello, and welcome to episode number 49 of Photo Kitchen. I am your humble host, MD Welch, and today we're talking about four things that you need to know about Capture One to give you a better experience, make things a little bit more efficient, uh, kind of maybe even unlock that creativity inside of this program. Now, these are four tips that are going to help both people that are just starting off with Capture One as well as experienced users. So let's go ahead and dive right into it. First thing I want to talk about is the interface inside of Capture One. I'm not a huge fan of the interface of Capture One. Uh, comparatively to other programs. And my first big complaint, and actually really my only complaint, is the default setting for how that you view images inside of it. There are two uh, essentially viewings going on by default inside of Capture One. The first is this browser, which is really a film strip uh, for your thumbnails where you can go ahead and see your images. Now, if you've never experimented with this, there's a little line between the browser and what is called the viewer on the other side, and you could put your mouse right between this line, you'll get the little uh, side to side arrow here, and you could drag this out. And the minute you drag it out and you get multiple thumbnails, you actually have thumbnail control and you can make your thumbnails as big as small as you want to. Now, some people love this feature. They love seeing their thumbnails on this side and they love seeing their image over here. Now, it just so happens I shot in portrait orientation for this particular photo shoot, so it doesn't hurt me. But in landscape, sometimes you lose a lot of space here because of the way that the layout is. Also, I'm not a big fan of film strip interfaces. I've just not. In any program, personally, I don't like it. Fortunately, Capture One's like, hey, no problem. You could customize this however that you want to. It's just not as uh, kind of intuitive as you would like it to be. So here's the secret. First of all, you could turn the browser on and off by going up to view on the menu bar and coming down to the word browser. Now, there are keyboard shortcuts for this that are going to make your life a lot easier, and I'll give you a bonus tip in a second on how to change those. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off my browser, and I have my browser turned off. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is come right back up to view and there's this thing called the viewer. So the viewer is kind of like the difference between grid view and loop view inside of Adobe Lightroom Classic for those of you who have maybe come from that program over to this program. You have your thumbnails, thumbnail controls up in the upper right hand corner so you can make the thumbnails as big or as small as you want to, no problem there. If you double click on an image, let's say I double click on this one, it will put that into a full screen or kind of a loop view to rob uh, or use that Adobe Lightroom Classic terminology. Now the problem is, is there's no way to get back to the grid view easily with the mouse click. You could double click and get into this easily, but you can't get out of it. So you need to go up and use viewer on the menu bar, which is going to take you way, way, way too long. Now, there's a couple of different ways to solve this. First of all, I do have something called a loop deck that because we're doing a digital recording, I can't show you, but the loop deck can have programmable things and you could just go ahead and program the buttons to do whatever you want to. But if you're not using a loop deck or some sort of hardware, I think some, they're still calling them a MIDI interface, something like that. Uh, if you don't have that, you could just come up to edit on the menu bar, come down to edit keyboard shortcuts, and in the uh, shortcut menu, you're going to go to view, and you're going to scroll down, and you're going to find show, hide, viewer, and you're going to give that a keyboard shortcut that you remember. Since I'm still working or still work with Adobe Lightroom Classic from time to time, I use the same keyboard shortcut, which is the letter G for grid, and that will toggle me between the two views. I've also set the letter F for full screen mode, which I'll show you in one second. Now, the benefit of doing that is I have easy keyboard shortcuts to remember. They're right there on the keyboard. They're actually right next to each other, which is nice. The downside is, is I am taking away shortcuts for tools. I think specifically the gradient tool and the point focus point tool. I'm not really mad about that because I don't use keyboard shortcuts too much with tools. I do use them for a few, but not specific, hyper specific ones like that. But do be aware. And when you do change it, it will give you a little thing down at the bottom in red telling you, oh, this is this has been changed. But now that I have this set up, I could hit G to toggle between the two uh, view modes here. I could always double click to get into the loop view. I hit G to get out of it. Very nice and neat. By the way, speaking of full screen mode, here's your bonus tip of the day. If you hit the letter F, or if I hit the letter F, because I've set full screen that way, I will go into full screen mode. Now, unlike a lot of programs out there, Capture One doesn't have full screen mode just as a display feature. A lot of programs, when you go into full screen mode, you're just looking at it in full screen. You're looking at as a viewer. You do have your controls, these little arrows over the side. You will get your controls over here for your image quality control. And by the way, you will also have browser over here, even though that you've turned it off. It's available in uh, full screen mode, which might be nice if you needed to quickly go from one image to another and you did want to go out of full screen mode. But if you do have one of those aforementioned 
uh, hardware interfaces like Loop Deck or something like that. You can control the, uh, those features here. So I'm just gonna come in and just really crank these things up or down so you could go ahead and see this. So there's my clarity. Let's uh, let's open up the exposure a little bit. Let's come over to saturation and crank up the saturation a little bit too much just so you could see it on the screen. And I have access to this. There's also express keys in Capture One that you could use as well in full screen mode. I don't use them, but uh, you have those available to you. And uh, it's nice because you're in full screen mode. This is as big as the image is going to get filling up the screen. And if you have a client looking over your shoulder and you're trying to dial stuff in and you do have the ability to change it, that's a nice feature inside of full screen mode. And stick around towards the end of the video. I have some more tips and tricks for viewing that's gonna save you a lot of time, but let's go ahead and change gear. So the next thing that I want to talk about is the concepts of presets and styles. And you could access both presets and styles from the style section over on the far right hand, I'm sorry, left hand side of the screen. Got to get my left and my right straightened up here. Now, uh, styles and presets can be a little bit daunting at first because if you're brand new to Capture One, you might be like, well, what's the difference here? Because a lot of programs don't have different, they'll call styles presets or preset styles, but they don't have both. Well, it, it's actually a very powerful feature in Capture One once you get used to it. So first of all, let's talk about presets first. If you come to any sort of adjustment, any panel that allows you to change some feature on the image. So in the adjustment section, let's come into exposure here and I'm just going to open up the exposure a little bit and I'm going to open up or increase the saturation just a touch, right? So I have my exposure settings here. There are these icons at the top. One of the icons second over from the right are three lines. This is your preset menu here. Any presets that you have specifically for the exposure panel will be available here. And you could just kind of mouse over and you could see what those would look like. You could even see the styles, I'm sorry, the settings change, not the styles, the settings change here, as well as come down and save a custom preset. Now, the benefit of this is, as I'll just go through here and show you the process, is first of all, when you do a preset, any adjustments that you've made will automatically have a check mark and be saved here. Anything that you didn't do will not have a check mark. But if you did do something, but you didn't want it to be a part of the preset, say you did contrast, but you wanted contrast to never be part of the preset, you can just uncheck that from here. Unfortunately, you can't plug in the values in this window. They have to be plugged in beforehand. And by the way, that's a small little uh, bonus tip here, not even worthy of calling it a bonus tip, but when you're making presets, when you're making styles, you always get the settings the way you want to first before you make the preset or the style. So that's why they don't have the control here. But if I hit save, it will allow me to save this to the preset section for at least exposure, and I could go ahead and give it a name. And since you could get very in depth by having different presets for individual panels, I highly recommend getting specific with names. Not necessary here, I'm gonna go ahead and click cancel. Now you might say to yourself, oh, well, why don't you just do global things here? And indeed, sometimes you do a whole global where you need exposure, you need uh, contrast or black and white or whatever that it is, and you're going to do combinations of it. But having individual presets on the panels are great because sometimes there's things like, say, curve adjustments where you just have a specific curve, say contrast luma here, where it will just give you that specific preset just for that setting. And the benefit is, is that your presets and your actual controls are in the same area because they're linked because they're in the same panel. So that is efficient, but it is a little bit weird because you are doing presets on a panel by panel basis. Now, one interesting thing, I'm going to go ahead and just do a quick import here. I'm going to click on the import button. And if you come into import and you come down to the actual adjustment section, you could actually stack styles. Stacking styles means that you could do multiple styles, multiple presets to an import. So if you had, say, a preset for metadata, a preset for keywords, a preset for sharpening, you could come through here and you could go ahead and load up those presets and set them however that you want to, and you could stack them. Now, this is a little bit weird again, because now what you're seeing is you're seeing the first preset. In this case, I called one metadata import, and then a plus one here for an additional preset. But you could have I haven't really run into a limitation. I don't I don't stack presets that much, but I've had like as many as four and never had a limitation here. That can be good or bad depending on your workflow, and I'll leave that up to you on what works better for you. However, 
I'll cancel this. What you can also do in lieu of, say, a preset is you could actually make a style. Now, all that a style is, is multiple settings or multiple presets linked together. And it's not really multiple presets. It's actually better to say multiple settings for multiple panels. So, for example, I have a preset uh, called the metadata preset where when it comes into here, it will go ahead and load in. So, to show you that, I'm just going to go ahead and reset and then apply a meta metadata import. So I have things, I have a contact field here I'm not gonna show you. I wanna have as a little bit of privacy on the internet, uh, but I have a description fields, category fields. I have, uh, let's see, my image status here for copyright, that stuff filled in. I also do keywords as well because even though the keywords and metadata are separate panels, you can add the keywords into there. So that's a metadata import preset that I use. But I also uh, have found that I do other things that I want to have happen to all images on import or on tether. So a few examples of those might be some sharpening, might be some lens corrections as well. Uh, style here, I might use ICC profile and do pro standard. I shoot Sony, so I use the pro standard feature and I always do things with extra shadow. Now with all of that in mind, what I could then do is I could come into styles and presets and instead of making a preset for each panel and then when I do an import or a tether, I can actually just go ahead and have one style, which makes life a lot easier because then you only have to worry about applying one thing. To make a style, you have to come into the style section. You have to come to styles and presets. Click the little ellipse here. And then again, whatever you've applied to that style, you have that already set. And when you say save custom style, you're going to get this list here showing you everything that you want to apply. For some reason, I have found that it doesn't include metadata. So you do have to check the fields for metadata that, that you want to do. But again, you could go ahead and hit save, give this a specific name. It will tell you, by the way, that some things that it doesn't think should be part of a style. It always does film curve, which is really weird because I always do film curve, uh, which is part of the base characteristics. But nevertheless, it will give you that warning and uh, I kind of ignore it. But it will tell you sometimes that there are settings that you might want to ignore. So I have that set up that way. And the benefit now is I'll just go ahead to my tethered panel and just show you the other place where you could do this. If I come into, let's collapse a few of these things down and clean this up. If I come into next capture adjustment, I could come into style here, come into custom styles, and I have a style called import underscore tether, and that will go ahead and apply everything that I want, sharpness, lens corrections, all of those things, my metadata, my keywords, and it's all consolidated in one area. So presets, panel by panel, styles, multiple settings across multiple panels, multiple you know locations. Uh, I think styles are great, especially for import, but also good if you're doing certain like black and white conversions where you need additional contrast, maybe you need additional white balance to be uh, uh, you know worked with. Styles is great for that. Next up on the list is a tool that can be a little bit confusing, but it actually has some differences and it's important to understand those differences. And I'm referring to the features called copy and apply and also copy slash apply. Uh, now, you will see these and you will think that they're the exact same thing. In in truth, they do very, very similar things, but there's a difference of mechanics here. Now, first of all, if you can't see both of these features, you can right click or control click on the actual toolbar up here and then go to customize toolbar and you will see all of the things that you could add or subtract from this area. Uh, and you can modify that. There's also a default uh, section here as well, which interestingly on this version of Capture One, I don't have copy slash apply as part of it, but I do have copy and apply. And I will stress that and quite a bit as I'm doing this. So I have both of them here. And first of all, the, the basic overview, what both of these things do is allow you to copy a setting from one image and then apply that to other images or multiple images. It's just how you want to work. That's the difference between the two features here. So what I'm going to do first is I'm just going to go ahead and uh, let's just go ahead and make a change here since I have a nice color image. I'm going to come into adjustments and I'm just going to apply a black and white change. I'll just go ahead and enable black and white. And so we have a black and white image. So it's easy to see here. So I have a black and white image uh, and whatever adjustments I could choose that as well as you'll see in a second. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to select some additional images. Now, very important thing inside of Capture One, actually any program that has a copy paste, you know, auto sync sync kind of feature here is always make sure that you have the image that you wish to use as an example 
uh, as the what's called target image. And in Capture One's case, it gives you this thick white border here. That's your designator. Uh, I wish it was thicker. I wish it was bigger. Dear Capture One, if you're watching this, first of all, thanks for watching. And second of all, make that like, I don't know, neon pink or thicker at least so it stands out. So this is your this is your cue that it's going to use, in this case, the black and white on the other ones. Now, if you go to copy and apply and just click the mouse, what you're going to do is you're going to open up what's called the adjustment clipboard, very much like what we just saw with presets and styles. And it will give you a list of every everything that has been done to this particular image. And it's going to ask you down at the bottom, do you wish to apply these settings or do you wish to copy these settings or do you wish to cancel? Now, if you hit apply, what it's going to do is it's going to carry it out to the other remaining four images. Now, one thing I found when I was uh, prepping this is Capture One sometimes will apply, but you won't see it until you come and you double click on an image and then all of a sudden it changes there. I don't know why that is the case, uh, but it just does that. So. Uh, unfortunately, there you go. Uh, you kind of have to go through here and see them change. But now I will see all four of them change and it works, right? So you could go ahead and apply. Now I will go ahead and do an undo here. So I get my images back to the way that they were. So there we go. Now we're back to where we were. Now, one thing to point out is that you can, inside of copy and apply, just copy the settings. You could choose to go ahead and copy the settings. I'm going to come back to that in a second. I'll just do cancel for the moment. Now, the difference between copy and, and apply and copy and apply is just basically workflow. It, how, it depends on how you want to work. Now, copy, apply are actually two icons. They're in the same area, but they're actually two icons. You could choose to copy or you could choose to apply. Now, in my case, I only have a single image here. So to apply would be a redundant because you have the image that you're copying from to apply. So it doesn't do you any good. But let's say that I'm like, okay, I want to use this black and white, but I'm, I'm doing it selectively throughout a group, right? I'm stretching here, but work with me. I'm going to go ahead and hit the copy button. Now, unlike copy and apply, when you do copy, there's no dialogue window asking you, what do you want to copy? It just copies that directly. So if you wanted to avoid that dialogue window, especially if you're trying to just copy a setting, copy slash apply is a little bit faster then you you come to an image, click on it, go ahead and do an apply. And then there you go. And for some reason that seems to render faster in this viewer than uh, the copy and apply, but you get the idea here. So you have copy and apply. Now you could also do the same thing with copy and apply. You could click on this and just choose to do a copy. And then when you come into another image here and you do an apply, it will carry that out as well. So they do work hand in hand. One keyboard shortcut that I am going to teach you that I think is really helpful, especially with copy and apply, is if you wanted to copy and an apply and you didn't want to have to worry about dialog settings, take your cursor, put it over copy and apply, hold down the shift key, click the mouse button once, and it will go ahead and copy and apply with no dialog window. And that's usually the fastest way that people work with these settings. But there is a difference. Uh, you will have to figure out which one that you prefer over the other. Me personally, I almost exclusively use copy and apply, but every now and then copy slash apply does help out when I'm doing uh, selective editing on my images. The fourth and final tip inside of Capture One, and actually probably this is like tip seven or eight because we've done a little small tips in here. But the last big one is taking advantage again of viewing your images inside of Capture One. Now, if I double click on an image, we've already seen that I could toggle between viewer and go from either viewing a single image or seeing the thumbnails. And I'm using my keyboard shortcut G to toggle between the two right here. But one thing I wanna point out when you're in a single image view is there's these icons over here in the upper left-hand corner of essentially the image area. And the icon that looks like four squares kind of stacked on top of each other, um, if that is orange, an interesting thing will happen. If you have more than one image selected and then you double click on them, you will see all of those images inside of the viewer here. Now, why would that be? Well, maybe you want to isolate them down. Maybe you're trying to decide from one image to another. One thing that I have complained about with Capture One in the past is it doesn't have a survey or compare view like Lightroom Classic does. And I've done a Lightroom Classic survey compare video. And if you're still using Lightroom Classic, uh, check that out, please. Uh, and I will do a link in the description below for that particular video. But Capture One also has some features that are similar to that. Uh, and I'm going to show you that using this particular feature. Now, if you don't have this turned on, whatever the target image is, that's going to be the image that you view. So that's its critical 
critical that you actually see that orange icon lit up so you could see all of this. Now, the benefit of this is, is your full screen little trick that you have earlier. You could hit the letter F and you could view these images and you could work on them as you go. Now, there's no auto sync inside of Capture One, but if you had four images and maybe the exposure or flash power shifted a little bit and you needed to make an adjustment, you have them for comparison and you could go back and forth. And of course, you could do that in full screen or you could do that in regular mode. It can, it's totally up to you. But here's a few things that I really like about this particular view mode. I'm just gonna go back to full screen so you could just see everything here. One thing that I have that's problematic or or working with any sort of images in any program is especially when I'm doing stuff like this where it's head to toe or maybe location work and the person's not you know, directly in frame. I don't know if things are in focus, maybe the expression isn't great or even better, let's do more than say a simple amount of images. Let's do this amount of images and come into here and I have these images here. Because it keeps making the images smaller and smaller, it makes it harder to find detail. So what a lot of people will do is they will just have less images selected and they will have to do this, you know, going through multiple times as they're working with the images. But here's a nice trick inside of Capture One. Now, first of all, you could do this with or without keyboard shortcuts. It's totally up to you. I am going to be toggling uh, and I've gone up uh, with my arrow and let the toolbar drop down here so I could see the toolbar. But I'm just basically going to be toggling between the zoom in tool and the select or black arrow tool. Now, the zoom in tool keyboard shortcut is the letter Z. The direct select or select tool is the letter V. And by the way, it's V in just about any program here. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold down, I'm going to hit Z. So I'm in zoom. And then here is the trick of the day. I'm gonna hold down the shift key on the keyboard. And when I click, I'm zooming in, but I'm zooming in on all of the images here. So now, even though that I had full length, I could zoom in and I could see the expression of my subject. If I hold down the shift key and then the space bar, I will toggle into the hand tool here so I can move the images around and reposition them. That's a very, very nice feature. And then if I wanted to come back in and I wanted to start to deselect images, start to peel away from stuff that I don't like, I hit the V as in Victor to go back to my black arrow tool, or I can just come up here and click on the tools if you're not a keyboard uh, shortcut fan. So now what's nice is I could come in and I could say, okay, let's, let's call some images down, right? Some images that I don't like. And I'm just doing this hypothetically because I kind of like a lot of these images, but I'm going to come into here and start clicking on these. And I'm holding down the command key on the Mac, the control key on windows. And what I'm basically doing is I'm selectively removing these images from the group that I am actually actually looking at here. And I'm just going to do a few of them just to make life a little bit easier to see. There we go. And as I'm doing this, it's restructuring and it's changing them around. It's giving me more room to work. Uh, so I have bigger thumbnails to work with, but it stays at the current magnification. And the benefit of this is, is when I come back into group here, when I hit G or come back into thumbnail view, these images are still selected. So if I'm doing this and I have a client looking over my shoulder and I'm trying to find those best images here, I'm weeding them down and now I'm looking at the four images. And the beauty of this is, is either in this view or in the thumbnail view, if I do something, say like I hit five for five stars, or if I'm in here and I hit three for three stars, what will happen is it will go ahead and it will set those images up and I can rate and do these things as I go. And I can view them with a lot more detail and I have a lot more accuracy as I'm working inside of Capture One. One small final thing with this particular view, and I'm gonna get out of full screen here just so you could see the interface. If you're doing any sort of adjustment, if you're doing any sort of like um, uh, ratings, metadata or anything like that, Capture One's a little bit wonky with that. If you have edits selected here, these, this orange box up here, and it's orange and it's turned on, if you do say a metadata rating of say one star, right, it is going to do it for all four. If you turn off edit selected and then you do say, you know, four stars, it only does it for, in this case, this selected image on the far left hand side. It does not with edit selected do all of the images when it comes to um, um, uh, any sort of adjustment. So if I come into here and I make this one image much brighter, the other remaining images stay in their current thing. You will have to do some sort of uh, holding down the shift key, uh, for this double arrow in any panel to apply that to all of the images if you wanted to, or use presets or copy and apply. That really depends on you. And I've, I've talked about this before and I'm not gonna talk about it anymore as far as a lack of auto sync, but it is important to point out because this might impact how you're doing sorting or cataloging or rating or something like that or developing. But it is nice that you could view multiple images and edit them separately if need be. So 
if one image, maybe the flash power wasn't bright enough, you could be in here and you could just be in this view mode and you could edit one while comparing it to another one. And that's a very nice feature. Well, I hope you've enjoyed these four tips for Capture One ease of use and powering your creativity along. If so, please like, subscribe to the channel, uh, leave a comment down below. Is there anything about Capture One or any other sort of post-production that you're looking uh, for secrets on? Uh, I would love to answer those questions in future videos. Please share this with fellow photographers and people in post-production. And until next time, I am MD Welch wishing you all the best from the Photo Kitchen.